welcome to another episode of Theology Thursdays. Now, a couple of episodes ago, we looked at the human person and particularly at the creation of the human person, the human person created in the Imago Dei. And we briefly talked about how God created us in freedom, that he didn't create us as, as robots, um, you know, machines that would love God automatically and be programmed to love God and do good. No, God wants us to love him freely. So I just want to unpack a little bit more this idea of freedom. Now, last time I did mention the distinction between two types of freedom, both of which are true. The first being that um, when God creates us in freedom, he allows us or gives us the freedom to act as, as free moral persons. And this really is a freedom from restriction, that we have this freedom to be able to, to make decisions ourselves. And this develops in each individual's life as we, as we grow older, obviously. So an infant doesn't have a lot of freedom. But as they grow older, we allow uh, young people a bit more freedom and so on until they're basically 18 in, in, in Australian law, um, whereby they are, they are free citizens. They, they can do you know, certain things as, as adults. This is a freedom from restraint, a classical idea of freedom and a very true idea. But it's not the whole picture that... We are free from in order to be free for something, something good, something noble, something true. The Dominican uh, theologian, moral theologian, Servé Pinquez, who worked in the, in the late 20th century and, and died relatively recently, was a great thinker about freedom. So I just want to give some of his explanations for freedom, some of his ideas about freedom in this short episode. So the first thing he says about this idea of freedom for, he calls it freedom for excellence, moral excellence. That just to talk about freedom as being freedom from restraint is important, but it's, it's, it's a very poor substitute for the full understanding of freedom. Um, he, he says that, you know, the 20th century, one of the great things of the 20th century is it has been that the idea of freedom has been universalized and and certainly that's been the case in terms of, you know, laws allowing more and more freedom and so on. That's, that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a good thing. Unfortunately, and I think his observation is correct, that the freedom for excellence has been lost. It's not talked about. We all know it, I think, implicitly. But it's never talked about. And it means that the discourse or the conversation around freedom is, is, is quite a poor one often and very mis misunderstood. You know, everyone's for freedom, but not everyone understands fully what freedom is about. So he says that freedom, uh, freedom for excellence is, is the classical understanding of freedom, you know, dating back to the, to the Greeks right through to Christianity. And it, it started to be lost really in the late Middle Ages and through the Enlightenment, sort of the two between freedom from and freedom for was sort of split apart. So he gives, I think, a really helpful analogy of, um, of what real freedom is and, and the, in a sense, the distinction of the two, but also how the, the two, you know, need to come together. And he talks about, you know, playing the piano is, is the analogy he uses. So to be able to be free to play the piano, first we need the freedom from restraint. So, we, so what does that mean? It means that perhaps we need a piano. You know, we need the actual object of the piano, so we need enough money to be able to, to afford the piano and a space in the home to, to have a piano and so on. And um, we need to be able to perhaps afford some lessons and so on. So there's perhaps the freedom from the financial restraint, the restraint of space and so on. You get what I mean. So there's that freedom from. But if that's all freedom was, you know, and, and we had the piano and you just started you know, banging the keys, you know, we'd say, oh, you're free to play the piano, but it's not, you know, please stop. You know, it's terrible. It just sounds awful. Please stop playing the piano. So he says, no, we, we understand that the true freedom to play the piano involves more than just having the piano or just the freedom from restraint. We need other things to be able to develop true freedom. We need things like discipline. We need things like a teacher. We need things like the tradition of playing the piano. We need repetitive action and practice. And that's tough. You know, ask any 
young person who's learning to be able to play the piano. They've all said, I don't want to play the piano anymore. Yeah, I'm bored. I don't want to go to my lesson. Because it's difficult. It takes time. But over time, we begin to master the piano. We begin to master it through, through repetitive lessons, through learning you know, the trade of playing the piano, the art of playing the piano. And this develops so we can play pieces. You know, we can read music, we can play the pieces, and it sounds, you know, really, really good. And then if we really develop freedom, the freedom for excellence, we start to create. You know, we really start to create our own music with the piano, our own beauty, our own, our own art with the piano, and that's, that's freedom for excellence. So you can see that, that we need both. We need the freedom from and we need the freedom for excellence and we need to speak about them together. And I think it's a really helpful analogy. The other thing that, that Pinkers does is talk about the stages and this sort of coincides a little bit with, the, with this idea of learning the piano. What he does is that he says that there are three basic stages of freedom. The first stage is the age of discipline. Now discipline, we often associate discipline of you know, someone being firm and directing us. Um, usually associated with school. So the age of discipline is, is really that age, if we want to talk about age, as primary school. So in primary school, um, you know, discipline is associated with you know, reward and, and punishment. You know, do this and you'll receive this. Do that and you, this will happen to you. you know, reward and punishment. But we also need to remember that discipline comes from the same word as disciple. So to be a disciple means to have a teacher, a master. And so this is for a young person, hopefully that's their parents, it's their teachers, you know, significant adults in their life, who'll be teaching them the way of freedom. But first through discipline. So basically teaching the difference between right and wrong, the difference between good and evil. And we learn this, as I said, through reward and punishment. There's not a lot of sort of moral decision making in that, in that early years because we, we're operating through the, through the master's eyes, through the teacher's eyes. So hopefully by the time we get to adolescence, we get to the second stage. And this is the age of virtue. So here, it's really important for a young person, for, as, we, as we're growing, to learn that it's good to do good for good's sake. And this really only happens if, we, if we're learning virtues through the primary years, but then into to adolescence. So here, Parents and then teachers gradually take off the levers, you know, take off the levers of restraint and allow the young person to, to make some choices, to make decisions. Not so much based on reward and punishment. Now, this may still be in place, obviously, for an adolescence, but um, it's important that the adolescent starts to learn, OK, I'm going to do this action not because there's a reward at the end of it or perhaps a punishment if I don't do it, but because it's the right thing to do. And it's really important this develops through, really through the high school years and that by the time of year 12, and you know, teachers, any teachers out there you know, know this, but year 12s tend to be a bit more self-motivated, tend to be a bit more mature in their use of freedom. You know, they'll do things because it's the right thing to do. So this is that second age. Now, hopefully, by the time we mature and we developed virtues, then we're in adulthood and we can really exercise mature freedom. Now this never, in a sense, as we know, never in a sense completely occurs in all areas of our life, but that's what we're aiming for, to ultimately get into the, the, the stage of moral excellence in our lives. You know, that we're creating our own beautiful music that's true and, and good and noble and virtuous in our moral lives, which is moral excellence. That's the aim of the moral life. It's not, I, I just want to do whatever I like. No, it's to create something really beautiful. And for Christians, that means to really be truly the Imago Dei, truly who we're called to be in the image and likeness of God. Pinkers calls this the freedom of the saints. You know, the saints are so free that they can't sin. The saints are so free that they can't sin, which is, a, which is quite a mind-blowing thing. We think, well, that's not really free, but it is. 
They're so free that they can't sing. It's like Mozart when he played the piano. He couldn't play a false note. He was so free. So I hope you enjoyed this, this episode. Um, remember, if you've got any comments, questions, um, leave them in the, in, in the comment section below. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And please come and visit us at the Campion website um, and find out more about this, this great college, this great project of uh, liberal arts education here in Australia. And I look forward to seeing you next time.